Good to see all of you here. I'm glad you're here. The Lord is glad you're here. And if you are one of our guests, we hope you will stick around our services, let us get to know you, and you get to know us just a bit better. Grab your Bible. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 23 through 27 as we continue in our series entitled Blessed Assurance. John has written this brief epistle in order to give these Christians, as well as Christians today, the assurance of not only our salvation, but of our fellowship with God. That we really do enjoy communion with God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let's read verses 23 through 27 as we begin. Hear now the word of the true and living God. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as His anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in Him. Let us pray. Lord God, we pray that You would help us. Abba Father, help Your children this morning as we gather around Your Word to see clearly that You are a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. When I was younger, I remember the television commercials for Men's Warehouse. Uh, You probably remember George Zimmer looking into the camera and saying, you're going to like the way I look. You're going to like the way I look. Yeah, you're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it. There it is. You're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it. A guarantee. A promise. When someone breaks a promise, that's, that's awful, isn't it? Especially, I think about uh, those who make vows and enter into covenant in marriage. Anyone who's been through divorce, you know the awful, painful, heartbreaking, reality-shattering experience of those broken promises. But I'm here to tell you that when God makes a promise, it is not like any human promise. Because God is God. He is not a man that He should lie. When God makes a promise, He keeps His promise. A vivid example of this is found in Luke's writing. Not only his Gospel, but also in the book of Acts. In Luke chapter 24, Verse 49, we read, Behold, I, Jesus talking here, He says, Behold, I am sending the promise of My Father upon you. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. That's how His Gospel ends. As He picks up His Gospel, we read in Acts, excuse me, as He picks up the book of Acts, Acts 1 and verse 4, And while staying with them, He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which He said, You heard from Me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then you come to chapter 2, and promise fulfilled. The Holy Spirit falls upon the apostles, they begin to speak in other tongues, and the Gospel goes forth from Jerusalem. Again, God, that's just one example. You've got a whole book, a whole Bible full of promises that God has made and that He has kept. And so, when we come to 1 John chapter 2, 
and we read about the promise that He made to us. That is, the promise that God made to Christians. We read that that promise is eternal life. God has promised us eternal life. And indeed, as you read John, uh, his epistle here in its larger context, we have that eternal life. We abide in God and God abides in us. We experience it in the present. But there's the promise that there's more in store. The promise that there is more coming from God. And so, don't turn loose of that promise. And there were many threats to these early Christians. And that is part of the reason why John is writing what he's writing to these Christians is because they are assailed by these false teachers. We were introduced to them last week. The term that John uses is antichrist. And it's not just one. You know, we, we spent some time developing how the idea of antichrist has evolved into something that is unlike anything that John wrote about. The prevalent modern idea of antichrist is we're waiting for some shadowy political figure to rise out of some particular government somewhere in the world, and he's going to lead the world astray in all this, and this is all based in a particular reading of prophetic literature. We read everything that John wrote about Antichrist. Every time that word is used in the New Testament, we read it last week. I'll invite you to, the, the video is readily available on YouTube if you need a refresher on that. But suffice it to say, the Antichrist, number one, was not just singular, there were many. Many Antichrists. And these Christians weren't waiting for an Antichrist or even these Antichrists to show up. Many Antichrists have show, are, are present. They're already there, John says. We saw that. And these antichrists were these false teachers, these uh, heretics. Uh, and it's, it's the early roots of what will become full-blown Gnosticism. One of the uh, strongest opposing teachings that the early church faced uh, in its early stages was the, the teaching of Gnosticism. And there are Christians that come after John who spend quite a bit of time dealing with the various flavors of of the Gnostic heretics. But they were already there. And the early roots were showing up. And I wonder if some of the Christians to whom John was writing were tempted and gave in. And they, like these false, deceiving teachers, went astray from the truth. It, happened, it can happen then. It certainly can happen now. That people here a certain teaching, and it draws them away from the purity of the gospel. It draws them from that uh, away from the purity of relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it is interesting that you see all three persons of the Godhead present in this text. He specifically mentions the Father and the Son, and it is the anointing there that points us to the Holy Spirit. The whole triune God has conspired in making you a promise and has also conspired in your advantage to ensure that He will keep His promise to the end. Verse 23, literally what John writes here, he says, all the ones deceiving, or excuse me, all the ones denying the Son do not have the Father. No one denying the Son has the Father. In other words, you cannot slight the Son Jesus, and expect to be good with God. This eliminates every possibility for religious pluralism. It refutes the idea that, you know, this idea that all roads lead up the mountain to God. That simply is not the case. There is only one way. And people think, well, that's too exclusive. It's actually very inclusive. Anyone who comes to the Son will find Him a more than perfect Savior. A more than willing Savior. He will find that Christ is willing to give us access to the Father, and indeed does. And again, that is a promise. It's a guarantee for everyone who confesses. The rest of verse 23. The one confessing the Son has the Father also. Notice how personal this is. The one denying and the one confessing. 
You cannot de- depend upon anyone else's faith. You can't deny on, well, my great-grandparents were Christians and therefore I guess I'm just born into this thing. You have to make this thing personal. It must be your faith. You must be the one who is continually confessing Jesus is the Son of God. But the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. You have the Father and the Son abiding in and with you. And that's a personal thing too. Is it true that the, the, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit dwell within the body collectively? Absolutely. But it also points to the individuality here of the one confessing. And so, already you have this sharp contrast between those denying and those confessing. And again, there's, there, as I've been saying all along, there's no third group in the middle where, I don't know, you get to do this dance where you, you know, kind of, I'm kind of in, kind of out with God, you know. No, no, it, there is no middle ground. There is no third way. Whoever denies the Son has, uh, does not have the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. They go together. But you know, this is a grand assurance for those Christians then because they were confessing the Son. And it's a grand assurance for us today because we continue to confess the Son. And therefore, we have the Father also. Father, the Son, and we'll deal with the Holy Spirit when we get to the anointing here in just a moment. But we can't speed right ahead to that just yet. There are those who want to, want to get straight to the anointing and and uh, claim that for themselves. But what ends up happening is often a distortion of that. Because you can't skip over verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. You is in the emphatic here. In you. In, in, in all y'all. And, and it's collectively, but also again, it also touches the individual. What is it they had heard from the beginning? Well, they had heard the apostles teach the Gospel. They had heard the apostles teach the Word of God. The primary text that the church leaned into was the Old Testament. Why you see, for example, in Acts chapter 8, Philip uh, meets the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading from Isaiah. The scroll of Isaiah is before him. He's reading from chapter 53. What's chapter 53 for us? Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I except someone teach me? And Philip got into the chariot and beginning with that text from the Old Testament text began to teach Jesus to him. Because Jesus is in every page of the Old Testament. Indeed, He's in every page of our Bible. And we can we can uh, point to the written text and we can say, this is what I have heard from the beginning. Indeed, John is going to emphasize the writing in verse 26. I write these things to you. The sacred writings, the Christians have always had the sacred writings. God has preserved His Word across time and space so that His people can have it. And why do we have His Word? Number one, certainly to give us the assurance of all of the marvelous promises that God has made and kept and is keeping. But also, uh, to emphasize here, verse 24, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Father and the Son. To have the assurance that we have relationship. We remain. We abide. We stay with the Father and the Son. And that abiding is fellowship language. It's relational language. And indeed, we do have relationship with the triune God. But also, don't miss this. Again, the sacred writings, verse 26, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. The, the, the truth of Scripture is able to identify error. It is able to make you wise not only to salvation, but also to identify the error. John does it right here. The apostle of love, right? But John also knows that, well, love protects. Love defends. And love also rejoices in the truth. And so the deception of these antichrists, of these false teachers, must be identified. And John does. He is very clear. No pale pastels here, right? He is very clear in identifying the error in order to protect these Christians. 
Because again, you have the promise. You don't need to go elsewhere looking for it with these religious heretics on the loose. And so John, he writes to these Christians, what happens when someone comes along with a new teaching? And certainly it was a new thing. These uh, Gnostic, uh, proto-Gnostic perhaps in, in, the, in the days when John is writing this, but the early roots of what would become that full-blown Gnosticism. What, what, what were they teaching, the Gnostics? They were saying, as I've said before, oh, I've gone to the edges of the ethereal realm and I have had an enlightening from above. And aren't you lucky to have me? You see, you haven't had the experience that I have. But good news, I'll share it with you. Perhaps for a nominal fee. That's what was going on. And you know, that hadn't gone away. There are still those who claim to have had an ethereal experience. Muhammad claimed to have had an ethereal experience. Joseph Smith claimed to have been visited by the angel Moroni. You can also see it in so-called Christendom where you can get on TV and you can watch Jesse Duplantis up there smiling like a Cheshire cat talking about how he has gone and he went to heaven for a time. Oh yeah, it's still there. And again, when that new teaching comes along, ooh, ooh that, oh, that's very interesting. And it can draw many people away. And does. And again, it seems like that's what was going on in John's day. We, we read verse 19 about those who went out from us. But they were not really of us. If they had been of us, they would have stayed with us. And we talked about what a grand assurance that is for us in, in even the, the blessing of apostasy of knowing that as, as we remain faithful to God, we, we really are of Him. We are of God. But again, here are these deceivers and these John is very blunt. He calls them liars. He calls them deceivers. They are antichrist. They are those who are opposed to the purity of the doctrine of Christ. But he emphasizes again, first of all, what you heard from the beginning. He emphasizes, look, I'm writing these things. He emphasizes the written word as well as the anointing that you've received. And the anointing, we, we touched on it briefly last week. The anointing is related to the Holy Spirit. And the, uh, there does seem to be a play on words here where Christ, uh, it, it, he, Christ literally means anointed one. So Christ, he, he's, he's the anointed one of God. But we are those who have an anointing as well. That we are related to Christ. Because He has poured out His Spirit into our hearts. And it's not that John is setting um, the revealed Word of God in opposition to this anointing. No, the revealed Word of God is Spirit-given. And what the Holy Spirit does is He illuminates the revelation. It's not that He's going to bring new and different teaching or, or bring new revelation. He's going to shine new light on the old light of Scripture, if you will. And you know, that's important. One of the things that John teaches here, he says, uh, uh, the end of verse 27, but as His anointing teaches you about everything. Well, what do you mean by everything, John? Do you mean everything pertaining to art, history, the combustion engine, and those sorts of things? Well, uh, I don't see any manual or instructions about those things in here, right? But, this does have to do with building a worldview whereby when you do art or history or science or what have you, you're going to do it to the glory of God. And chances are, it will be more accurate than those who are outside of the realm of the Christian worldview. You know what's fascinating I don't know if you've been following the uh, the, the new saddle or the new uh, telescope that they launched into space, the the Webb telescope, and they're seeing these images from light years away. And 
there are Christian scientists who made certain predictions prior to receiving the data that the James Webb telescope was bringing in and from deep space. And, and what is fascinating is those Christians who, have made, who made certain predictions, uh, certain hypotheses, their hypotheses fell in line with the data. You know what happened to the unbelieving uh, astronomers and, and scientists who were making? They're scrambling to catch up because guess what? The data that they're seeing out there isn't matching with their previous theories. Isn't that fascinating? That when you disconnect yourself from the Christian worldview, you actually end up always playing one down. You're always playing catch up. And I'm sure there will be new and novel ways that they'll try and come up with different ideas and theories about those sorts of things. That's the way it goes. It was about 100 years ago. What was the, what was the, the, the projected age span of the universe about 100 years ago? It wasn't the, what is it now, 20 billion years? Is that what it is? I'm not even certain what it is precisely, but 100 years ago, it wasn't that. And the reason is, they began to realize, ooh, actually, we don't have enough time to squeeze everything we need into in order to get to where we are today. And so you lengthen the amount of time, and oh, it's, that's probably what's going to happen with this as well, and they'll try to force the data to fit their preconceived notions. Again, what does all this boil down to? Well, you may not have a manual on building a James Webb telescope looking into deep space here, but this provides a worldview, a Christian worldview, whereby we can look at the world, the created order that our Creator, who we acknowledge, made, and we can draw certain uh, scientific uh, hypotheses and theories, and guess what? When the, the science finally catches up and we have the data, that data will agree with what we have. Our God is a God who has provided us indeed with everything that we need to do art, history, science, literature, everything to His glory and even uh, to the highest degree. I digress. The, the Spirit here, what is particularly in view is, again, in the context, you have all of these various false teachers who are claiming to have an anointing. And John is saying, no, no, no. They may be cl claiming something, but it's not what they say it is. In fact, chances are it's just a deception because even the devil can masquerade as an angel of light. You, Christians, and he's, he's got it for every all Christians here. It's, it's uh, plural in the original language. All y'all have the anointing. You've all received. You don't need to go to these jokers out here, right? You have no need for anyone to teach you. Well then, John, why are you writing? Again, con context is key to understanding what John means here by you, don't, you have no need that anyone should teach you. He means any of those false teachers. Any of those uh, Gnostic teachers out there who are making these claims, you have no, they have nothing to teach you. You have everything you need. And it's given to you by God. That's the emphasis here. And uh, the rest of verse 20, 23, uh, excuse me, 27, and it is true and is no lie. You know why that anointing is true? It's because it's, it's, the, it's the spirit of truth. As John says in John chapter 16 and verse 13. Again, you have everything. And just as it has taught you, abide in Him. And that's the message that they've heard from the very beginning. To abide in the Father. To abide in the Son. To abide in the Spirit. No need to go running off after so-called new revelation. You have everything you need. And the Holy Spirit has provided you with everything you need. We can pull in a couple of other references here that can help fill this out just a bit further. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is breathed out by God. And the idea there of breathing, if, if you want to do a little exercise with me, you take your hand and you just put it right in front of your lips. And as you said, say, say uh, here, repeat this after me. All Scripture is God-breathed. You feel that breath on your fingertips, right? 
That's the idea here of breathed out by God. That's the nature of Scripture, what we have. It is the very breath of God. And so, God, as we, when we become Christians, God gives us His Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Helper, in order to help us to understand and to receive the things that God would have us to receive. Furthermore, as you go through history, church history, there have been various ideas that have cropped up. I think especially of the century, fourth century, when there was a, a man by the name of Arius who came on the scene, and he, was, he began to claim that the Son is not co-equal with God. He's actually a, a creature. Arius is kind of the, the, the forerunner to our Jehovah's Witness friends today. And so what, what happened in that time? Well, the, the church, armed with the Scriptures, armed with the Holy Spirit living within them, denounced that heresy for what it is. This happens all throughout church history where you have new and novel ideas. And it doesn't just have to be religious ideas either. It could be social ideas. Isn't Christ Lord over all? Well, then that would mean He's Lord over all people, saints and sinners. He's Lord over all society and culture. He's Lord over all governments. He's the ruler of kings. And in fact, it behooves the kings to kiss the Son, as Psalm 2 says. That everything has been placed under the feet of Christ for the church, by the way. And therefore, when new and novel ideas about, say, a person's identity crops up. We have everything we need in the God-breathed Word in order to identify true identity for humans. Created in the image of God. Male and female. Yes, we have no need that anyone should teach you because we have what we heard from the beginning, the Gospel, the Word of God. We have what has been written, which clearly identifies error when it rears its ugly head. We have the Holy Spirit living within us to help us to not only live lives to the glory of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but also to call others to faith and repentance in Christ Jesus. That's what's at the heart of the Gospel is the Lordship of Christ. That God the Father sent the Son into the world to die on the cross for sin and for sinners. He doesn't stay dead, of course. He raises, rises from the dead three days later. And through His death, burial, and resurrection is declared to be Lord of all. And it is incumbent upon every single person to bow the knee to King Jesus as long as they have breath in their lungs. To confess Jesus Christ as Lord even of their life. And then to live out in conformity to that good confession. Because listen, if we do not bow the knee to King Jesus in this life, we will bow the knee to King Jesus at the end of time. But then it will be too late. And it will be to eternal destruction and condemnation. Why we need to confess Him. Confess the Son right now, today, because it is the day of salvation. Let us pray. We thank You, Father, that You have entrusted Your Word to frail creatures of dust. that You have preserved it across time and space throughout history so that Your people have everything that we need for life and godliness. And we thank You for condescending to send the Spirit into our hearts and into our lives so that we might have help in understanding the spiritual truths that are revealed in Your Word. 
by the enlightening that the Spirit provides us in the eyes of our hearts. To also live that out in conformity with Your revealed will. And also to call others to the same relationship to faith and repentance in Christ. Help us, Father. Help us with all the help that the Holy Spirit provides within us to be Your people as we abide in You. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.